I came home from work just 20 minutes early. When I thought about it later, it struck me. They cheated in our bed just 20 minutes before I was supposed to get home. Am I really that boring and predictable? I could tell you that I expected this, that I suspected her, but that would be a lie. I was stunned, paralyzed, overwhelmed. Angie and I were married for eight years, very happy years, if you ask me. And our life was great, energetic, fun, full of surprises. I didn't neglect her, didn't go on business trips, we didn't quarrel, she didn't act up, she didn't stay late at work. There was nothing, no sign to warn me. Seeing an unfamiliar car in front of the house, I quietly slipped into the house. I immediately heard sounds in our bedroom and knew. Time stopped. I stood motionless, listening, not listening, without thinking. I idly wondered if I was still breathing, if blood was flowing through my veins. Then I felt my heart pounding so hard that I was amazed they couldn't hear it in the bedroom. I stood there I don't know how long. And then I quietly turned around, walked out the door, got into the car, and drove away. I found a bar, sat down at a table, and drank a bottle of cold beer. I thought about having another one, but stopped. I didn't want to be drunk. I felt numb. I remembered reading that when a guy gets shot, like in a fight, the pain doesn't come right away, it's numbness first. That's how I felt. But I knew the pain was coming. I sat there for an hour, and of course the pain and mental images came. My stomach clenched, my heart pounded, my fists clenched. I was just a wreck. I couldn't see the future beyond the next few minutes, and they looked pretty damn bad. What the hell should I do? What does a husband do in such a situation? What does Angie expect from me? A crazy thought came into my head. Absolutely insane the exact opposite of what a typical, loving, predictable husband would do. In my state, I couldn't tell whether it was good madness, bad madness, or just plain madness. Without hesitation, I decided that I would do it. Maybe it's time to stop being predictable. I went to an electronics store and bought the high-tech gadgets I needed. Then I drove straight to our house. I was over an hour late, and I knew Angie would be wondering what happened. Alex, what happened to you? I was. I. Are you all right? Angie looked great. She had just taken a shower and put on her makeup. And she's always beautiful. But she was puzzled and a little alarmed when I walked into the house with my head down and the darkest expression I could muster. Looking unhappy, I simply said, Angie, in a voice that was beginning to crack. I looked at her, letting the grief I felt show on my face. Please sit with me in the kitchen. I need to talk to you. She followed me, and we sat down next to each other. I looked at her gloomily for several long moments, then spoke. Please, just let me say this and try not to interrupt. I had an affair. Three months with Christina Blodgett. Christina was our casual acquaintance. I had never been with her, and she had recently moved out of state with her husband, but Angie didn't know that. It's over now, I'm done with it. But I had to tell you this. I had to. I had been looking down, but now I turned my haggard face towards her. I thought it was just sex, that's all. That this has nothing to do with you and me. Because I love you, desperately. But I understand. That I'm lying to myself. Every time I, when I was with her, I hurt you, although you didn't know. What loving husband would break his marriage vows and give himself sexually to another woman? I convinced myself that you would never know that it wouldn't hurt you. But it was a selfish lie I told myself to keep the romance alive. Angie, I feel so ashamed. I can't even imagine how much pain this is causing you. I'm really sorry. And I cried for real my tears flowed not because of my fictional romance, but because of her real one. I looked at Angie and her face became studying. Of course, she was completely stunned, but not in the way an innocent wife would be. She clearly had no idea how to react. Before she could pull herself together, I continued, I want you to know one thing. Christina and I have never been together here in our house. I could never be in our bed with her. I just wouldn't do that to you. I thought to myself, I hope I stung you, bitch. I'm going to pack my things and stay in a hotel for a few days. I'm sure you don't want me in the house. I want you to take some time to think, 
to ask yourself if there is any way to overcome this. I love you and want to always be your husband. But, honestly, I don't know if I could handle it if you cheated on me. I'm so sorry, Angie. I'll go upstairs, pack my things, and leave in five minutes. Without waiting for an answer, I hurried upstairs. I packed my things, but also attached a microtransmitter to the telephone line behind our bed. It will transmit all telephone conversations made on this line from anywhere in the house to one of two small tape recorders I have hidden in the back of the garage. I couldn't wait to see how Angie would feel about my infidelity. I went downstairs and returned to the kitchen, taking a moment to hide the tiny microphone under one of the counters. It will transmit to a second tape recorder in the garage. Angie was still in shock. Her eyes were glassy. Her mouth was still open. When I walked in, she pulled herself together a little. Alex, she began. I, I just can't believe it. How could you? She really didn't know what else to say, and I didn't give her time to find any more words. Baby, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. Now I'll go. I pray that you don't cut me out of your life. I'll call you in a couple of days, and we can talk whenever you want. I love you. With these words, feeling guilty and ashamed, I kissed her forehead and left. I had never done anything stranger in my life, and I didn't know how I felt. Well, that's not entirely true. I knew I felt better than if I had just gone home and played the devoted husband by simply telling Angie what I had heard. I didn't want to hear her apologies, her explanations, or see her tears. I didn't want to be that cliché, horny husband. Am I still suffering? I was dying inside. I was beside myself with anger and even more with grief. But I felt a certain grim satisfaction in knowing that at the same time I was messing with her mind. So much for predictability. What did I hope to achieve? I'm not sure I knew it even after I did it. But I knew one thing. Angie's reaction over the next few days would determine whether we stayed married or whether I would kick her cheating ass. I went and had a quiet dinner alone. It seemed to me that the more time I gave Angie to think, the better. Her first instinct would be to get angry, to insult me for my crime. I wanted her to think it through. At best, I hoped that she would actually think about how bad it felt to be deceived. It might have been too much, but I wanted her to play home movies of me and Christina Blodgett in her head. I wanted her to feel hurt, empty as empty as I was. Well, I don't know it probably was. Does she still love me? Or were we just days away from an unexpected farewell scene? And even if she loved me, my revelations would not have caused her such pain. How could she feel the same pain as me when she was doing the same thing? It may seem like a simple turn is fair game, or even no harm, no foul. And I sure as hell didn't feel it. Anyway, I decided to wait a week before talking to Angie. For now, I'll let her stew and listen to the hidden tape recorders to find out what she's up to. I called my office and left a message that I urgently needed to leave town to take care of my sick mother and was using my accumulated personal and vacation days. Then I made a new announcement on my cell phone. Hi, this is Alex. I'm going away for a few days, but please leave me a message and I'll call you when I get back. I checked into the local Holiday Inn, parked the car in the backyard, walked to the budget rental place, and rented a nondescript sedan. It would be easy to drive around town undetected, even in my own neighborhood. You may have had sleepless nights in your life, but not a sleepless night like the one I had when I saw Angie and some unknown guy together over and over again. I didn't imagine that I would ever be able to make love to her again. How could I see these familiar gestures without thinking about her with another man? Since I had no idea about this affair, I also had no idea about the reasons for it. Maybe our lives were predictable, maybe we were in a rut, and I didn't notice. But I was so happy with her, and I thought she was happy too. That night I didn't decide anything, but I didn't sleep either. After having breakfast at the motel, I drove to my house and parked a couple doors down. I waited until Angie left for work. Fifteen minutes later, I was inside and settled in the kitchen with two tape recorders. There was only one phone call about an hour after I left home. Angie called her best friend Connie and very emotionally asked her to come. 
Connie and her husband Brad were neighbors. He and I were just friends, but Angie and Connie were very close. When Connie arrived, Angie was in tears, and Connie asked, Oh my God, Angie, what happened? A terrible thing happened. You will not believe it. Oh my God, did Alex really find out about you and Tommy? I wonder, I thought angrily, Connie knows everything about this case. No, Connie, it's even worse. Alex had an affair with Christina Blodgett. Three whole months. Tonight he came home and confessed to me. He was crying. Connie, he looked broken. He said it was over, that he was very sorry, but he had to tell me the truth. I've never seen him so upset. There was silence for a few moments. Then Connie said, Angie, you need to calm down. Let's think for a minute. Actually, I don't understand why it's so bad. Now you truly have the upper hand over him. If he ever finds out about you and Tommy, you can tell him it was all about getting revenge on you. It's like a map, free yourself from prison. Listening to this, I groaned to myself. Thanks for your help, Connie, I thought. Angie said, No, Connie, you don't understand. I feel completely defeated. It doesn't make any sense. I know I did it too. But just the thought of Alex with her is like a knife in the heart. You remember what she looks like, right? All this time I thought that Alex loved me, and only me. And he slept with her. I can't believe how stupid I am for not noticing. Connie tried to calm Angie down, but it didn't work. Angie was overcome by the same destructive feelings that I was. Connie, I just don't know what to do. I've been feeling like I'm going crazy for the last two hours. You know as well as I do that Tommy was just a fling harmless fun. It meant nothing to me like you and Henry did last year. It was new information for me that Connie was also having an affair. Angie continued, and I never really thought about what my affair might do to Alex. I just thought I'd be careful, and he'd never find out. Just like Brad never found out about you and Henry. You had a lot of fun, it's over, and your marriage is still great. But now, she stopped and I heard her crying. Now I feel so torn apart. How can I trust him, this bastard, again? Everything. The special way we treat each other, the way he hugs me and talks to me. You know what I'm talking about. Oh shit, I could fucking kill him. Listen, Angie, Connie said soothingly. This is not the end. You said it yourself. Tommy is just a fling, and you still love Alex. Henry was just a passing fancy for me, but I still love Brad. If it was the same for Alex, why can't you both get over it? Angie's voice sounded muffled. Because now I understand what it's like, Connie. This is just killing me, my oh-so-predictable husband. You know how we joke that we can set his hours when he gets up, when he leaves for work, what he eats for breakfast every day. I guess I was wrong about all of this. I feel so used, Connie. I feel like he wiped his hands and threw me in the trash. Let me make us some coffee, Angie. For some time, not a word was heard, only the clinking of cups and the gurgle of water. From time to time I heard Angie quietly crying. While they drank coffee, Connie tried to calm Angie down, but to no avail. When Connie left, she made Angie promise not to do anything rash. Whatever you do, don't tell Alex about Tommy. Right now he feels terrible about what he did, and that's what you need. This is the only way you can control the situation. Angie sighed. I don't know, Connie. He was honest with me. I don't know if I can continue to lie to him. The only thing I know for sure is that Tommy and I are done. At least for now. Until I know if I still have my marriage, or even if I want it. I waited almost a whole week to call Angie. It was a long, surreal time in my life. I didn't call my friends because I didn't want sympathy or advice. I walked a lot in the forest alone, thinking or just wandering aimlessly. I tried to read a couple of books but they didn't interest me. I went to see a new action thriller at the cinema, but left after half an hour. I thought as best I could about the future. The only decision I made for sure was that if Angie and I broke up, I would move away. I needed a fresh start somewhere away from my memories of happier times. I spoke with a divorce lawyer who was recommended by an old friend. 
it turns out that no-fault divorces between couples who don't have children are quite routine, all of which can be over within a few months until the property settlement is contested. I asked him to take action, get the initial paperwork ready, but not give it to Angie just yet. Instead, I kept the notice papers I had the idea that I might personally drop them in her lap, depending on how things went. Living with Angie has made me happier than ever. She was loving, caring, and fun like no one I have ever been with. She made me laugh, and I seemed to make her laugh too. We felt easy and comfortable with each other. I always felt like myself with her, almost from our first date. And I figured it was because she liked the real me. I didn't have to put on an appearance or try to impress her. She teased me about the predictability of my habits, but respected my seriousness and sense of responsibility. First of all, I always trusted her. I considered her honest and loyal. So what now? Apparently, honest and true was worth about the same as WorldCom stock. I knew I still loved her, I just couldn't imagine a life where I couldn't trust her. More than anything else, I felt humiliated. When you cheat on someone, I told her, it is an act of hostility, albeit an unconscious one. You are passing something on to your spouse. You are making a fool out of him. And this feeling of superiority that you are aware of a secret that they do not know infects all relationships. I couldn't believe Angie didn't secretly think a little worse of me. Her love for me was mixed with a little condescension and contempt. How could I ever forgive her for this? Every day, after making sure that Angie was not at home, I returned home and listened to the tape recorders. The day after her conversation with Connie, Angie called Tommy and told him that their romance was ending. I didn't learn too much about him from their short conversation. He was clearly younger, and there seemed to be nothing between them other than sexual attraction. When she told him she had family problems and couldn't see him anymore, he didn't seem crushed, just disappointed. He didn't beg or get angry. His reaction was more like, okay, sure, I understand well, it was amazing, no hard feelings. I also learned that they slept for about three weeks, usually at his apartment, but once or twice at my house. I never found out how they met. The casualness of their relationship both comforted and disgusted me. I was relieved that Angie wasn't in love with him and that he wasn't threatening to take her away from me. Their tone on the phone was almost the same as that of her swim coach or massage therapist. It made me feel like I had been replaced. On the other hand, how could she just jump into bed with this guy? Do our vows to each other mean so little? What was Angie's love for me worth if it didn't stop her from being with this guy just for fun? I couldn't answer this question. Apart from the usual phone calls, I only heard long conversations between Angie and Connie, some on the phone, others at home. In all these conversations, Connie said the same thing, don't tell Alex about your affair. Keep the upper hand by making him feel guilty. Angie was unhappy. She was jealous, angry, and felt guilty. She felt all the pain I hoped she would feel. Tormented by thoughts of me and Christina, unsure of how much I cared for her, devastated by the destruction of her trust in me. She was incredibly angry at me, so much so that she sometimes said she didn't care if she never saw me again. But at the same time, she was forced to look at her own behavior. She tried to make Connie understand how selfish and destructive what she did was, although Connie resisted admitting it. I trusted Angie as much as she trusted me, and she betrayed my trust. Just because I didn't know about her affair didn't make it any less wrong. She admitted out loud that cheating made her think worse of me, even though it wasn't my fault. After five, six days, Angie was still no closer to deciding what to do. Connie basically told her not to confess, but to attack me, but Angie wasn't convinced. I was a little surprised that Angie didn't even try to call me. I wouldn't answer the phone if she called, but I would know about the call. I assumed that she felt that as the guilty party, I was the one who should have called her first. Exactly a week after my confession, I came home at Forzo and cooked a nice dinner for myself and Angie while waiting for her to get home from work. I picked a day when I knew Connie wouldn't be around because she was dating her husband. I did not want any interference in what promised to be a painful confrontation. Angie walked in cautiously around 5.45. 
she saw a strange car in front of the house and had no idea who might be in the house. She gasped in shock when she saw me and the dining room. The table was covered with a tablecloth, candles, and two sets of our expensive porcelain. I stood at the stove in an apron and stirred something. She could smell the sauce I had prepared for the veal and the roast potatoes in the oven. Hey, Angie, I said, trying to look worried and scared. I hoped. I was hoping that if I cooked us dinner, then maybe we could. Will we talk tonight? Alex, you scared me to death. Where is your car? Oh, it's being repaired for a few days, and I rented a car. Sorry about that. And why didn't you call me earlier? I was. I don't know. Angry, confused, worried. Well, Angie, I was scared too. I wanted to give you some time. I was so afraid that you would just scream at me and throw me out of your life forever. I'm still afraid you'll do it, I said, looking at her. Perhaps, she replied. I have no idea what to do, Alex. I've been in so much pain this week. I cried, thought, and worried. How could you betray our marriage like that? How could you destroy my trust in you? This is not going so well, I thought. Perhaps following Connie's advice, Angie acted aggressively and attacked rather than retreat. Angie, I said, I made a mistake. It was wrong to deceive you. This is the worst thing I have ever done, and I will regret it for the rest of my life. I'm here tonight in hopes that we can discuss this and see if there is a chance for our marriage. You may think that I don't know what you went through last week, but believe me, I do. She began to answer angrily. Damn it, Alex, how can you know what I went through? Then she suddenly changed her tone. I'm sorry, she said more calmly, almost tiredly. Looks like a wonderful dinner. Why don't we eat and then try to talk about everything? At dinner, we both relaxed a little, managing to talk about neutral topics. Her job, our families, how her brother's new company is going. I told her I was taking some time off to try to work things out. She asked where I was staying, and I told her about the Holiday Inn. It was pretty lonely there, I said with a sad smile. Yes, it was pretty bad here too, she answered with an almost sad expression on her face. I was waiting. I wanted one of two things, for Angie to confess to me about her affair or for her to continue to suffer, thinking that I, too, had cheated. When she remained silent, I pushed her. Well, what should we do? Do you want to ask me something? Is there something you want to tell me? I'll never know what she might have said because the kitchen door suddenly opened and we heard Connie's voice. Angie, are you there? She entered the dining room, saw us, and immediately attacked me. Alex, what are you doing here? You had the nerve to come back here. Do you know how poor Angie suffered? I tried to contain my irritation. Damn it, she was supposed to be with Brad today. Angie had the same thought. Connie, I thought you and Brad were going to dinner. Oh, he works late, and we had to postpone it. Angie, you're not going to let Alex talk you into coming back to the house, are you? I began to see an opportunity to use Connie's surprise visit to my advantage. I could argue with her, allowing her to say all the things that a smug and innocent wife might say. Connie, I said quietly, I know you're Angie's friend, but I'm not sure it's any of your business. Oh no, she flared up. Who do you think held your wife's hand, brought her coffee, listened to her cry? Do you have any idea how this last week has been for her? Yes, Connie, I know, I answered, and Angie said, Connie, please calm down. No, I won't calm down, Connie insisted. Alex, cheating on Angie and then throwing it in her face is the worst thing you could do to her. How could you be so heartless? I remained calm. Are you saying that it would have been better if I had had an affair and not told Angie about it? Would that fix everything? It startled her. She looked less confident, a little embarrassed. I also noticed that Angie blushed and turned away from us for a moment. Pulling herself together, Connie exclaimed, No, Alex, that's not what I meant. Okay, Connie, please help me understand. Is it wrong for a married man to have an affair behind his partner's back? Or is it okay if your partner never finds out? Or are you saying that revealing the truth about the affair only makes things worse? Please clear this up for me.
I watched Angie while Connie and I argued. She seemed determined and also happy to let Connie speak for her. At the moment, this also suited me quite well. Despite her predicament, Connie remained aggressive. It's not difficult, Alex. You cheated on Angie. It was wrong. It was disgusting. Even if you didn't tell her, it would be a terrible violation of her trust. But I have to wonder if your confession was just to get rid of your own guilt. Angie was clearly not happy to hear this. Connie, I said, I think what you're saying is that cheating isn't so bad as long as it's a secret, but when you admit it, it's even worse. Do you agree with this, Angie? My wife looked worried. I don't know exactly what I think. I just know that ever since you told me about you and Christina, I, I was just beside myself. It's terrible what you put me through. Okay, let me ask you as directly as I can. Should I have kept my affair with Christina a secret from you, just ended it and left you in the dark forever? Before she could respond, Connie interrupted the conversation. The answer is no, Alex. You'd always have a secret over Angie, a nasty, dirty secret. You'd always feel a slight contempt for her, knowing you had something hot going on and she was too blind to notice. Don't you see how this humiliates her? I didn't answer, although I was delighted with her answer and there was silence for a long minute. Okay, Connie, I think I understand what you mean, but I think now is the time to leave Angie and I alone. We have a lot of difficult things to go through, just the two of us. Connie looked at Angie, who nodded at her. Yes, Connie, thank you for being such a good friend, but Alex and I need to talk alone. Connie reluctantly said goodbye and left. When I turned back to Angie, she looked even more confused than usual. I asked her to wash the dishes while I went and made coffee. I poured us two cups and took them to the table. Angie, what should we do? What do you want me to do? Do we have any chance? Honestly, Alex, I have no idea. It's, it's harder than you think. I never thought that anything you ever told me could make me so unhappy, so confused. Was I wrong to tell you about my affair, Angie? Should I have hidden this from you? No, she exclaimed suddenly bursting into tears. No, doing it behind my back would be even worse. Oh God, I think I'm going crazy. I leaned over and took her hand, holding it tenderly as she sobbed for several minutes. Finally, she calmed down enough to say, Alex, I think it's best for you to leave. I know we haven't discussed this yet, but I don't think so. I'm just not ready for this yet. Can we meet in a couple of days? I knew she was struggling with the dilemma of whether or not I should confess the truth, and it was very important to me that she did so. Of course, Angie. How about I cook dinner here again on Friday? No, Alex, this time I want to cook. We quickly said goodbye. I kissed her on the cheek, hesitantly, as if doubting whether I dared, and left. All evening Angie behaved completely differently than an innocent, deceived wife. There was little shouting, no angry accusations. Of course, I knew why she didn't act like that she wasn't innocent. But I wondered if she thought how strange it was that she didn't express any rage at what I had done. Over the next two days, Angie and Connie continued their conversations. Connie persistently tried to persuade Angie not to admit her affair, and Angie felt insecure and lost. It was clear that my arguments in the argument with Connie were putting pressure on Angie, but neither she nor I knew what she would do in the end. By Friday, I decided I'd had enough. One way or another, the truth will come out tonight. I was hoping for Angie's honesty, but if I don't get it, I swear to God she'll get it from me. I suddenly realized that I almost felt sorry for her. I knew exactly what her pain was like too well, almost but my pain was the result of her real affair, and hers was just temporary suffering, which, in my opinion, she deserved least of all. When I walked into the house that evening, our roles seemed to be reversed. I was tired of playing the submissive, guilty husband and walked in feeling relaxed. Angie should have been the angry victim, but she looked tense and worried. Hi, Angie, I said and kissed her cheek again. You look great, and dinner smells great. Is there anything I can do to help? No, thanks, Alex. Maybe pour some wine. It's in the refrigerator. I'll serve the plates now. As on Wednesday, 
we silently agreed not to touch on the main issue during lunch. Instead, we ate, talked lightly, and enjoyed Angie's cooking. As we sat over coffee, I decided to start first. My marriage could have ended at the end of this conversation, but I didn't want to wait any longer. We don't have to dance around this anymore, Angie. You need to tell me honestly how you feel and what lies ahead at least from your point of view. No guilty husband, trying to win back his wife's favor, would ever speak with such force, but Angie did not seem to notice. Instead, she just looked at me, shocked, with tears in the corners of her eyes. Alex, me. I still don't know what to tell you. Every time I think about you and Christina, I start crying. I feel empty inside me, a hole in my heart like never before. I don't understand how this can ever go away, how I can trust you again. I didn't say anything, hoping to hear a but. But, but I wasn't honest with you either. I cheated on you too, I had an affair. She stammered her last words and burst into tears. After a minute, she looked at me, still crying, probably expecting shock or anger from me. Instead, I sat quietly, looking at her. Can you tell me about it, Angie? Avoiding my gaze, she said, just a guy I met at tennis lesson. We used to have a couple of drinks after class, and he would always flirt with me. And then one evening, we were alone in the bar, and, and, she fell silent and cried quietly, covering her face with her hands. Then she looked up. Wait a minute, damn it, Alex. Here I am confessing to you, but you have never told me anything about yourself. Christina, don't I deserve the truth too? Well, first of all, Angie, have you noticed that you never asked me about this? But yes, you also deserve the complete truth from me, and I have two things to tell you. Firstly, I already knew about your novel. I came home a little early last week and saw you in our bed, Angie. And secondly, I never had an affair with Christina Blodgett. She and her husband moved to Vancouver last January. I made it all up. Angie, I never cheated on you, never. Angie looked at me, not only stunned, but also incomprehensible. Wait a minute, did you lie to me, Alex? Then, when my first statement startled her, the color drained from her face. She stared at me, her embarrassment giving way to shame. You saw us? She whispered. Yes, I answered coldly, feeling pent-up anger overcome me. Yes, Angie. And I left. And an hour later, I came back here and told you a crazy story about me and Christina Blodgett. I wanted you to feel at least a little of that pain, that sadness that I felt. I could tell she was struggling to put it all together. She looked completely confused, which wasn't hard to understand. I waited a couple of minutes and then continued. Edgy, we still have a lot of conversations. Please call me when you're ready and I'll come back to the house. But it better happen soon and you better be ready to be completely honest with me. Otherwise, this marriage is over. I got up and, without looking back, left the house and drove away. I didn't forget about the divorce papers in my pocket. I decided not to take them out. As angry as I was, I wasn't ready to take that step yet. Angie's confession didn't make everything better because nothing could. But she was honest, perhaps loving me meanther more than just an opportunity to dominate me as an innocent victim. I left, had two beers at the Holiday Inn bar, went upstairs and fell asleep with a ball game on TV. I was tired, depressed, angry and hopeful and interesting combination. My cell phone woke me up at 8.15. This early on Saturday it had to be Angie, and it was. Hello, I stayed awake. Oh, Alex, I'm sorry I woke you up. Her voice sounded trembling and scared. It's okay, Angie. I stopped and said nothing more. Alex, I know what I need. Oh, God, how are you going to forgive me? She fell silent and began to sob. Finally, she calmed down a little and said, Today we can speak. I'm just going crazy. I'm so afraid of losing you that I can't even think. What are you doing today, Angie? Maybe we'll meet later. Would you like to go somewhere for lunch? She seemed to calm down a little. Lunch is great, but please, not in public. Okay, I said. I can take some sandwiches home. What's your schedule today? I need to do something and go to the supermarket, but I will be back by 12.30. This is fine. 
Yes, everything is fine. Alex? Yes, Angie. I love you, she whispered. And before I could answer, she hung up. I quickly showered, ate breakfast, then went to the grocery store and bought sandwiches for lunch. I got home by 11 o'clock, which gave me plenty of time to listen to the recordings of what happened the night before after I left. At first, there was only the sound of Angie crying. After a while, she calmed down and washed the dishes. She then called the help desk, asked for the Blodgetts, and was told the number was no longer in service. A couple of minutes later, she called a woman named Rosemary Burke, who was friends with the Blodgetts. Angie casually asked if she had seen them lately and Rosemary replied, Oh no, Arthur got a job in British Columbia around the beginning of the year, and they moved there. After chatting for a few more minutes, Angie hung up and immediately called Connie and asked her to come over. As soon as Connie crossed the threshold, Angie began to cry again. Connie, I'm afraid I've lost him. I think Alex is going to divorce me. Angie, what are you talking about? It's his fault, not yours at least, that's what he thinks. No, listen. Angie explained to Connie what I had told her at dinner. A long silence followed. Finally, Connie said quietly, almost admiringly, This is incredible, Angie. What a strange act on his part. But how do you know it's true? Maybe he lied tonight just to mislead you. No, Connie, I called Rosemary Burke. She said the Blodgetts left in January. No, I thought about it a lot. Tonight Alex told the truth, there was no affair. But what really matters is that he saw Tommy and me. She fell silent and began to sob. I heard Connie stand up, probably to hug Angie as she cried. Their conversation lasted more than an hour. All Connie's bravado was gone, she saw just as clearly as Angie how I felt. They even repeated my argument with Connie from two nights earlier, realizing with horror how bad Connie's arrogant claims of adultery now looked. In the end, the best Connie could offer my wife was a little comfort. He still wants to be with you, Angie. Otherwise, he would never have done this. He would come home and throw you out of the house. I know, Angie said, sniffling. I tell myself this all the time. But after all that you and I talked about cheating, how terrible it is, he just sat there and let us talk about it. Angie, nothing we said that night matters. All that matters is whether Alex still wants to be married to you. Does he love you enough to give you another chance? It's partly up to you, but mostly up to him. You'll have to talk to him and see. Bravo, Connie. The first sound advice she'd given Angie since this all started. I finished the tapes before Angie got back and just sat in the living room, thinking. Hearing the noise of her car, I went over and opened the door for her. Angie came in with two bags of groceries, looking so meek and frightened as I had never seen her. Without saying a word, I went to the car, brought the rest of my things, and together we began to clean everything up. As we sat at the kitchen table with sandwiches, Angie muttered, I just don't know what to tell you. I feel so ashamed. Angie, I answered, how have you been feeling for the last ten days, thinking that I cheated on you with Christina? Looking straight at me, she said, it was terrible, terrible. It was such suffering and anger that I had never experienced in my life. It brought up all my insecurities, every feeling I've ever had about whether you really love me, whether I'm smart enough or funny enough, whether I'm enough for you, you know, in bed. Well, Angie, I feel the same way too. Except, as you know, I didn't actually cheat on you, you cheated on me. Now you can forget these feelings, but I have to live with mine. Without meaning to, I began to raise my voice. And I should add, you found out about my so-called affair because I admitted it to you, apologizing and telling you how much I loved you. I found out about your affair because I caught you when I returned from work. Is there something about our marriage vows that I don't understand? Did the priest mention that giving up everyone else was optional? Or have you just decided that loyalty isn't that important? I realized that I was screaming and that Angie was cowering away from me, sobbing. I stopped abruptly, got up from the chair, and began pacing around the kitchen, trying to calm down the anger that suddenly gripped me. I paced around the room for several minutes without saying a word. Then I couldn't stand it and started talking again, although very quietly. 
It was fucking stupid, thoughtless, selfish, Angie. Do you know how much I loved you? With you, I was happier than ever. I was looking forward to spending the rest of my life with you. If there was something there, boredom or something was still missing in your life, you could come to me, talk to me. If I didn't satisfy you as a husband or lover, don't you think I would try to give you everything you need? Stop, Alex, Angie exclaimed, jumping up from her chair. I deserved everything you told me, but not this. You satisfy me. Never in my life have I been as happy as I am with you. You are the best husband I can imagine, and I love the way you make love to me. It didn't happen because of anything you did or didn't do. It happened because I'm stupid and selfish, just like you said. I was like a kid who has a lot of money, but steals a chocolate bar from the pharmacy just for the thrill. You thought that you would never be caught, and that it would be easy small pleasure I intervened. Do you think Connie's affair with Henry has anything to do with this? She looked at me in shock. Do you know about this too? I just nodded. After a minute she said, Yes, I think it has. Connie kept talking and telling me how cool it was. And then she ended it without Brad ever finding out, and their marriage was better than ever. She told me blushing slightly that it had really spiced up their sex life. And that's why you decided that you'd like some of this yourself, I asked more calmly. She stared at the floor. Yes, probably. I mean, I've never even thought about a novel before, other than idle fantasies about Brad Pitt or something like that. But what Connie did made it more possible. I went back and sat down, waiting, and finally Angie told me the story she had started the night before. Tommy was in her tennis class, and they went out for drinks every week. One evening they were alone, and he pestered her. Then I didn't give up, but I didn't close the door either, Alex. Probably because I was thinking about Connie. And I was so damn stupid, I was sure I could do it like her, and you'd never know. And what happened to him? I fell silent, but I wasn't going to let her leave without telling me. It's all over with Tommy. I called him and offered to end our relationship. The day you found out. Okay, I insisted. What happened to him then? She avoided my gaze. We met six times. It was exciting because it was someone new after eight years, and I knew it was wrong. Remember what Connie said to me that night when you both thought I was having an affair? You would always have some contempt for her, knowing that there was something hot going on behind your back, and she was too blind to notice it. Well, isn't it true? Was there some condescending feeling in him, my dear wife? She silently lowered her eyes, and I continued my attack. Tell me what was more fun. I didn't exactly scream, but my voice was loud and cold, and I'm sure my angry face was terrifying. Angie backed away from me, as far away, on the other side of the kitchen, as she could. Seeing her frightened face, I immediately threw out all my rage. I felt exhausted and terribly sad. We were silent for several minutes. Angie, if nothing good has happened in the last ten days, at least my lies about Christina Blodgett made you see a side of me feel what it's like when the person you love cheats on you behind your back. I don't know what to do now, I don't have the slightest idea. I love you very much, but I'm furious and hurt, and I don't know if I can ever trust you again, or how I can make love to you again. Why don't you decide what you would do if I were caught cheating? When you think about it, let me know and we can talk again. I don't see how we can get any further today. And I headed towards the door. I heard her scream, Alex, please wait. But when I turned around, she just sighed. No, everything is fine. I will do what you ask of me. But Alex, don't you want to go home? I mean, you could ask me to leave. That seems fair. No, Angie, I don't want to stay in this house anymore. Of course, not in our bed or in the guest room, knowing why I'm here. I'll stay at the Holiday Inn for now. If necessary, I will find an apartment. As I left, I heard her cry quietly again. I drove back to the Holiday Inn with conflicting thoughts running through my head. I knew I loved Angie and that she was sorry. I also knew that I was angry with her. I knew I wanted our marriage to survive this. I also knew that I couldn't imagine ever being able to trust her again. I quickly packed my things, 
checked out and went to the airport. Within 45 minutes, I had my ticket and checked in for my flight to Florida. I was planning to spend a few days on Sanibel Island at a resort that had come highly recommended to me several years ago by friends. While waiting for my flight, I called my boss at work and had a somewhat irritated conversation with him. No wonder he was angry when I told him I would be taking two more weeks off for personal reasons. He actually threatened to fire me. John, I said calmly, my marriage is in trouble and I need time to figure out if it will survive. You know as well as I do that I have been your most trusted employee for nearly ten years and I have gotten the company out of some sticky problems. Ross and Ed from my department are aware of all our projects and they can continue the work in my absence. I also know, and you also know, that if you fire me, then in two weeks I will have another good job. It will take you much longer to find someone as competent as me to take my place. There was silence. I was telling the truth and John knew it. Finally, he said heavily, I don't like this, but I think I understand. Please come back as soon as possible, okay? Smiling to myself, I replied, If I don't need these two weeks, I'll be back sooner, I promise. By 8 p.m., I was settled into a nice room overlooking the pool at the resort. I decided not to worry about money for now. I was Mr. Pa conservative for years, saving money for the kids' college fund, even though we didn't have kids yet. It was now far from clear that I would even have a marriage, and I had no intention of continuing to be a fanatic in building my nest. The pool was big and gorgeous, and it tempted me. I put on my swimming trunks, went downstairs, and did 40 laps. I was a swimmer in college, and although I was long past competitive fitness, I still loved the feeling of floating through the water. I decided to make sure that every day I spent here I got a good workout in the pool. Even if nothing else works out, by the end of my stay, I will be in much better shape than before. I spent the next day relaxing and trying not to think about Angie. I got up late, had breakfast by the pool, went for a long walk, had lunch, and then took a nap. I drove around the area in the afternoon, just enjoying the warm sun, and then came back and did a lap in the late afternoon when the pool was less crowded. I had dinner at the hotel's restaurant on the veranda, then sat at the bar for a while, sipping a beer and watching the ball game on TV. To my surprise, I soon had company. A very attractive brunette in her early twenties sat down two chairs away. After ordering a drink, she started talking to me. It all started with a comment about the game, but soon we were talking freely about the resort, how nice it was, and so on. I was a little taken aback by her obvious interest in me. I'm pretty good looking, but I'm definitely not used to glamorous women in tight, revealing dresses trying to pick me up. A little later I invited her to sit at a quieter table, and she happily agreed. The conversation continued as she asked me about my work and where I was from. She also asked about my wedding ring, and I admitted that I was there without my wife and that we had some troubles. When I asked about her work, she gave me a long, slow, very sexy smile. I do personal services, she said after a minute. This cleared things up pretty well for me, I asked. Can I be a potential recipient of your personal services? Absolutely, she replied, still smiling. Just say the word. I've never been with a woman for money and never thought about it. But at that moment I was definitely interested. Nicole was beautiful and her there was a magnificent body, well framed by her tight dress. I hadn't had sex for over two weeks and of course at that moment I wasn't held feeling of devotion to Angie. A few minutes later we were already in my room. The next day I walked a lot and thought a lot. I came to Florida on a sudden impulse. I went to bed with Nicole obeying a sudden impulse. My first instinct was to bring Angie here. Of course I was still angry at Angie, but I also knew that I was still in love her and I miss her. Suddenly I was ready to talk to her to see if we could find a way to make our marriage work again. I had enough time alone. I went into town, found a travel agency, bought a plane ticket for Angie and sent it to her. Then I returned to the hotel and called her. Hi Angie, this is Alex. How are you doing? I'm very glad to hear from you, dear. I was going to call you, but it was hard for me to muster the courage. 
Can we? Would you like to meet and talk? Well, listen, I'm in Florida. I took a day off from work. I sent you a ticket, and I want you to come to me for a week. Alex, wow, this sounds great, but I'm not sure I can just quit everything at work and get on a plane. Angie, I've been thinking a lot, and you probably do too. We need to see if we can save our marriage. This is much more important than your work and mine. I told John he could fire me if he had to, but I was going to Florida. If you get fired, you can find another job. We both know you're the best paralegal in the entire firm. At the very least, you can probably find another job easier than a new husband. There was silence. Then Angie said slowly, that's not like you, Alex. What happened to the firm, careful, reliable man I was married to all these years? I'm not sure I'm him anymore, Angie. Now I'm the guy who decides what he wants and then makes the decisions. It's very important to me that you come here. I have a good number for us, and I sent you a ticket for tomorrow. If our marriage means as much to you as it does to me, you will come. And again silence. Then she hesitantly added, Okay, honey. It scares me, but I'll be there. Fine. I will meet you at the airport when you arrive. Bye, Angie. I didn't have a clear plan. This wasn't serious old Alex, Mr. Predictable, who was always planning. All I was striving for now were my feelings. I felt like Angie and I needed to be together if we were going to solve this problem. I also felt like we needed to have sex again. And I was damn sure I wasn't ready to do that with Angie in my own house, yet after hearing her there with Tommy. All day I thought about what Angie and I needed to say to each other, but nothing came to mind. Finally, I stopped worrying about it, took a lap in the pool, took a shower, and went after her. Angie looked lovely and nervous as she stepped off the plane. She pulled out one of her most beautiful summer dresses from the closet. Her hair was up, and she was ready for Florida. But she was also pale, and I saw how she looked at me warily as I approached. Hi, Angie, I said warmly and kissed her tenderly. She was surprised and delighted and pressed herself against me for a moment. Can I do it again, please? She asked, and I obeyed. On the way back to the hotel, we chatted amicably. I showed her the room and allowed her to clean up, after which we went down to the veranda to have a nice dinner. We didn't talk about anything important, as if by mutual unspoken agreement. She told me how she had argued with her boss about her sudden request for a week off, but it wasn't that hard to convince him. I realized there was some pause as Angie, and I even went so far as to have dinner together. After dinner, we walked around the hotel grounds. I showed her the pool and told her about my daily routine. Then we went upstairs. Angie became more and more nervous as we got ready for bed. After sex, Angie hugged me tenderly, smiling into my eyes. Alex, thank you for loving me so much. Honestly, I couldn't help but think, oh yeah, how does this compare to old Tommy? But I restrained myself and just smiled at her. We curled up comfortably and soon fell asleep. The next morning, we had breakfast on the veranda and then walked around the resort grounds. I was looking for a comfortable place to talk and found a bench in the shade. As I led us to the bench, Angie's wariness returned. She knew just as well as I that we were about to have a serious conversation, and she was hardly looking forward to it. Angie, I'm glad we're here, and I'm glad what happened yesterday. It was definitely a good first step. But we need to talk about something, and I'm sure it will be difficult for a while. I don't even know if we can get through this. Angie just nodded, looking serious and unhappy. First of all, I continued, I think we should try to be as honest as possible with each other. We both feel painful things. I'm angry and hurt, wondering how I can trust you again, and I'm sure you feel guilty and afraid for our marriage. I know we need to talk, Alex, and I will try my best. Please just give me a chance to make things right. Angie, I had sex with a girl for money a couple of nights ago. Oh God, Alex, she gasped. I won't lie to you and pretend that I didn't do it. I didn't plan on it, but she picked me up at a bar, and when she suggested, I said yes. And I won't tell you that I feel guilty. I'm still in so much pain, Angie, thinking about you and Tommy. 
I can't get it out of my head, so I did it. I felt like I deserved some fun too. And at this point, there's not much point in denying yourself because of Angie's devotion, is there? I sat quietly, watching Angie. She didn't cry, but her face was pale and her jaw was tightly clenched tears were just around the corner. I decided to wait for her to speak, no matter how long it took. Finally, she said, I think I understand this, Alex. How could you not get hurt and not want to hit me back? No, Angie, I said. It wasn't about you. It wasn't revenge, and I didn't do it to get in your face. I guess I'm tired of being Mr. Bay's responsible, Mr. Bertie predictable, the guy you can always count on to take care of others. I had an opportunity for something exciting, something enjoyable, and I took it. I sat in silence for a while, then spoke again. Wait, that's not true. I didn't quite understand correctly. Angie, I'm trying to be honest. Let me start from the beginning. It's absolutely true that I didn't have sex with Nicole to hurt you, but it's not true that it had nothing to do with you. Of course, you were on my mind while I was with her. In the same way, I don't believe that you had an affair with Tommy to hurt me, but that doesn't mean he had nothing to do with me. I was on your mind every time you were with him, right? It wasn't like a single woman was just having an affair. And I think you have to admit that part of the excitement was that you did it behind my back. Angie looked at me worriedly. Alex, she said with a slight tremble in her voice, you've changed a lot lately, so much so that I'm surprised how little I know you. You've never been so direct before, like you're holding nothing back when you talk to me. And you seem maybe stronger or colder. Yes, okay, that's probably true. But I think you've changed too, Angie. There was bitterness in my voice. The Angela Ravena I knew so well would never have cheated with another man in our bed. She looked like I had slapped her. A minute later, she began to cry and covered her face with her hands. I heard her say, Sorry, sorry, between sobs. I slid over to her and hugged her, letting her cry. We didn't say a word for a long time. When Angie had cried, she sat up and wiped her face with a napkin. Alex, before you left, you asked me to think about what I would do if you did it. You had an affair. I've thought about this a lot, and I have answers for you. I'd like to share them with you after lunch, if you don't mind. I nodded, and then she said, Is it okay if you have lunch here? I'd like to go. Wash and have lunch alone in the room. This will give me time to collect myself. We agreed that I would come in an hour, and she left. When I returned to our room, Angie was already waiting for me. She took a shower, combed her hair, and no longer looked as sad and lost as before. She asked me to sit on the sofa, and she sat opposite me in a large chair, holding a notepad and pen in her hands. She was wearing the glasses she always wore at work, which gave her a sassy secretarial look that I secretly adored. Alex, I thought about this a lot. I think what you really wanted me to think about was how I would feel if you did this, and how I could cope with these feelings. So I set up three columns. The first is what I will feel, the second is what you should feel, and the third is what I will try to do. As she sat there, glasses perched on her nose, explaining her neat little system to me, sounding just like the top-notch, highly organized paralegal that was so prized in her job, my heart just swelled with love for her. I was so angry and hurt that it was hard to remember how much I loved Angie or even why. This reminder of another side of her, her work ethic, and her organized, efficient approach to problem-solving brought home to me why she was so special to me and why it was worth trying to save our marriage. She continued, I'm afraid that for some of them there is nothing in the third column because I just don't know what to do. She looked at me with pain in her eyes. So I'll just read the article in the first column and the article in the second. And then if there's something in the third column, I'll read that too. Okay, Angie, I smiled at her. First of all, I'm just going to be angry that you cheated on me. And I know you're angry, Alex, and I deserve it. Then I would like to know how you could justify or explain such a terrible act. And you deserve this explanation too. I think I tried to do this at home before you left. How Connie's affair seemed so exciting and harmless, 
and I just stopped thinking and stupidly thought I could do the same thing and you'd never know and I'd never hurt you. Well, the behavior of your friend Tommy, of course, is also part of the explanation, but we will return to it later. Why don't you just get on with it? Well, I would be beside myself with uncertainty, Alex. So you must be experiencing the same feelings. What do you have in the third, fix-it column, Angie? She looked at me sadly. Nothing to ease the pain, honey. I wrote, show Alex how much I love and desire him, convince him over time that he is the only lover I want from now on. But I'm not so stupid as to think I can just snap my fingers and make it happen, Alex. I don't know if it's better not to talk about it at all. What I did to Tommy, or I'll tell you all the details, and then we can forget about it. Actually, I decided that I wanted to know every last detail, Angie, but we shouldn't do that now. I saw concern in her eyes, but she did not answer. After a minute, she returned to her list. Well, my pride was hurt when I thought about Christina, and I'm sure yours is too. Thinking that there is a person for whom you are number one, and then finding out that he has someone else. It's just unforgivable, isn't it, Alex? Suddenly she started crying again. Without saying a word, I walked over and hugged her for a few minutes, and she gradually calmed down. What else is on the list, Angie? Just two more things. The first is trust. How can you trust me now? How can I regain your trust? I said, I think I know the answer to this question. It will take a long time, and we will both have to work hard. I don't trust you one bit for a while, and you'll have to live with that. I want to know where you are every minute, who you're having lunch with, who called on the phone, what you're talking about with Connie. I stopped and winced. Oh yes, Connie, this is another conversation we have. Angie nodded. The last thing, Alex, is confidence. I used to believe that you had all my love and my desire, that you were my first and only choice as a husband, lover, and best friend. And I screwed up and took away it's yours, and now I need to find a way to give it all back to you again. She glared at me, her cheeks still damp, and I will do it, Alex. Just look at me, I'll do it. Every day you let me stay in your life, I will show you how much you mean to me and how sorry I am for hurting you. She suddenly stood up, walked straight to me, and fell into my lap, hugging me tightly. You are my best lover, my best friend. You are the only man I want, and if you let me, I will prove it to you every single day. We spent the rest of the day in bed, only separating for a leisurely dinner in our room. I even missed swimming for the first time all week. The next day, after a casual breakfast in the sun, we had another serious conversation and I shared with Angie what I had been thinking about our return. I need to hear about you and Tommy, Angie, and I'll tell you why. What I wish you could do is just call off your affair with him, just erase it somehow. But this is impossible, so I decided I wanted us to rewrite it. She looked at me confused and I said, Don't worry, I'll explain. But first, can you tell me how it started? Miserably but willingly, she told me a story, part of which I had already heard. A tennis lesson, a casual drink, then an evening in a group, an evening when they were alone, and he began to pester her. I said no, Alex, but I didn't stop it. And he continued to pursue me, not too forcefully, but persistently. On the night of my last tennis lesson, he walked me from the bar to the car and kissed me. And I let him, Alex. It was a short kiss, but we both knew what it meant. And the next week he called me and said we should play tennis together just to keep up our skills in class. He's a high school physics teacher, so he's always free after about 2.30 p.m. I agreed to take the day off and meet him at his house, and then we would go play tennis. She looked at me, and the pain was clear on her face. I have no excuses, Alex. He took the lead, Tommy was the one who did it, but I knew what I was doing too. What else do you know about Tommy? Well, he's a physics teacher, as I said, and he's from Buffalo. And he's engaged although that obviously doesn't mean he's faithful to his fiancée, she made the last remark with bitterness. After a moment I said, Okay, Angie, that's what I meant by rewriting. I want you and me to recreate what you did with Tommy. 
I'll ask you to write down for me the details of every time you were together. What you did, where, what it was like, who took the lead everything. And then I want you and me to do all this in the same places and in the same ways. This may sound completely crazy, but this is the best thing I can think of to cancel your affair. Angie looked at me with a very serious expression on her face. Yes, Alex, it sounds crazy, but it makes sense to me too. If you give me some time today, I will write down everything you asked. But can I ask you one favor? I nodded, and she said, Will you be able to read what I write down when we are lying in bed, when I am in your arms, after we made love? One way or another, I will be less afraid. How will you react when you read it? I smiled and said, Of course, Angie. Then she asked me another question. Alex, you said, All the same places. Are you saying that we will make love in Tommy's apartment? How can we do this? I gave her an evil smile and said, Leave this little detail to me. After lunch, we parted for several hours. Angie sat in the room and made her list not an easy and unpleasant task, I'm sure. I made a couple of phone calls, then did a lap in the pool. In just a few days, my stamina had already improved, and I vowed to myself that I would continue my pool routine at home. We had three more days together at the resort before we had to return to our work, and we enjoyed most of them. For a while, I didn't bring up this terrible list, and we just played. We swam, lay in the sun, went out to eat, and spent a lot of time either talking or making love. We also had some good conversations about our marriage. Before her affair, we both thought we were doing great, but, oddly enough, our conversations showed us both that things were a little outdated. We loved and appreciated each other, but each of us was a little lazy in expressing it. Some of this is inevitable. Of course, being married is not the same as dating. After all, but we agreed we could do better. We would go out to dinner from time to time, relax on the weekends, sometimes go for walks in the park in the evenings. We had a lot of ideas about how we could be more considerate of each other once we started thinking about it. Angie suggested planning an Alex, or Angie night, where the person whose night it was would have everything he or she wanted. Finally, we started talking about expanding the family. We both looked forward to having children and always felt like we would know when the time came. Angie, I still want to have children, but only after I know that our marriage will continue, and I don't think I'll be sure of that anytime soon. She simply nodded with a meek expression. I can't blame you, Alex. That's what I was worried about when I thought you were having an affair with Christina. How can I have children with a man I don't trust? and now you are in this position. I took her hand and smiled. Yes, but I'm looking forward to not being in it. This week has been amazing, Angie. It didn't make all my anger go away, but it did remind me how much I love you. She leaned over and kissed me, holding me tightly to her. When we broke apart, I said, One more thing. When I feel like we're back, that we're really going to be okay, you'll know. Because I'll come to you and say, Angie, let's have a baby. As we sat together on the plane home, I felt myself becoming more and more tense. My time with Angie, despite the circumstances, felt like a honeymoon. She was loving and passionate, desperate to show me how much I meant to her and how much she wanted me. In a thousand ways, I remembered how much I loved her and why. But it was in Florida, at a beautiful resort, a thousand miles from our normal lives and from the house where she cheated with someone else. I had serious doubts about how well my love feelings would survive when we returned home. Each of us would return to work with the stresses that it brought. And most importantly, I will again not know every minute where Angie is and what she is doing. I'll either have to start trusting her or drive myself crazy. Angie must have felt the same way I did. During the flight, she held my hand for several hours and looked at me every now and then with increasing concern. Finally, just before we were about to land, she turned to me and tightened her grip on my hand. Darling, she said quietly, almost in a whisper, please don't leave me now. Please believe everything I told you in Florida and remember everything we did. I know it will be difficult. I can tell some of what you're thinking just by looking at your face. But I'm still the same Angie who adores you, 
who would give anything to make up for what she did. Please give me a chance. I looked into her face, saw tears in her eyes, and forced myself to smile. I'll give you a chance, Angie, I promise. You're right, I'm stressing out just thinking about what it's going to be like. But let's both try to remember what the past week was like. She smiled at me, brought my hand to her lips, and kissed me fiercely. Agreed, she said. As we hauled our suitcases into the hallway of our house, I stopped and took Angie's hand. Honey, I would like us to spend the night in the guest room for now. I'm not ready to go back to our bedroom yet, but I want you with me. She nodded, looking concerned, but not surprised. It's okay, Alex. I was afraid that you would want to sleep separately from me. We unpacked, got comfortable, had a lazy dinner, and went through the mail that had accumulated. When I heard the phone ring, I immediately thought, Connie, I shouted to Angie, don't answer, okay? Just let her know. I had a feeling it was Connie calling, and I didn't want either of us to answer until we talked about her. She instantly blushed, okay, Alex. What I want to say is quite simple. Connie is your close friend, and you have the right to have the friends you want. On the other hand, I partly blame her for your affair. Not that it wasn't your choice or your responsibility, but having Connie fill your ears with the delights of her own adultery certainly didn't help. So I won't ask you to stop dating her. But from now on, the details of our marriage are forbidden, okay? I'm sure she'll want to know all about our trip and how we're getting on. You can tell her that we had a good time and that we're working on getting through this. But other than that, it's none of her damn business. Fair enough. I wasn't angry, but I'm sure my voice was firm and Angie didn't even try to disagree with me. Yes, honey. I thought about this too. I guess I'm a little mad at Connie myself. Oh, Angie, one more thing. Connie doesn't know that I know about her affair, and I want to keep it that way. Everything is fine. She nodded, and I dropped the topic. We talked for a few minutes about work and something else. It felt like we had just overcome a major hurdle, no matter how stupid it might seem. Angie, why don't you bring me your list? Shocked, she went to the suitcase and returned a minute later with a notepad. Climbing back into bed and handing me the notebook, she pressed herself tightly against me. I knew this would happen, but I'm just scared to death. Please, please don't kick me out now. I kissed her hair. Angie, I know this won't be much fun for either of us, but I'm still convinced that rewriting what you did to Tommy will help us get past this. So I have to take a look at what you wrote. She just nodded and hugged me even tighter. I took a notepad and started reading. I stopped reading and just lay there, feeling the adrenaline flow through me. I realized that my jaw was clenched so tightly that my teeth hurt. Angie lay next to me, no doubt feeling the tension in my body, afraid to move or make a sound. You asked for it, Alex, I said quietly to myself. Now be a man and be patient. It's not like she wrote anything amazing. Rather, it was the simple reality, the difference between my own miserable fantasies and the cold facts of Angie having sex with another man. It hurt like hell. I took a few deep breaths, felt myself calm down a little, and continued reading. I was angry and hurt, but no more than I was after I read about their first date. I decided to move on, read the rest, and get it out of the way. As furious as I was, I was also relieved that it wasn't worse. I realized that Angie was still clinging to me, and I felt her trembling. Everything is ready, Angie. I've read it all. She looked at me, expecting an explosion, but I just looked at her. Yes, I'm crazy, I said, and this hurts, hurts the most. All I could think about while reading it was, how could you? But I was also glad that it didn't get worse. Honestly, Angie, I was afraid that he would do something that you and I have never done. I'm sure you can understand this, I was afraid that you would want to go back to Tommy for what he gave you more than I did. She sat up on the bed, glaring at me. Nothing like that happened, Alex. I pulled her to me, hugging her, stroking her hair, feeling her begin to sob. It's okay, Angie. We'll do everything you did to him, only better, okay? She nodded vigorously at me, still crying. We held each other tightly until she calmed down, 
and then, without saying another word, we fell asleep. I woke up to the smell of coffee and quickly went downstairs. Angie stood in the kitchen in her robe, smiling at me as she prepared to cook the scrambled eggs I always ate for breakfast. Why don't we do something different today, Angie? She looked surprised but pleased, and I added, Not what you expected from your predictable old husband, is it? Well, I'm trying to be a little less predictable. She came over and hugged me tightly. As long as you continue to be the wonderful, loving man I married, I will be happy with a little unpredictability. When I arrived at work, I was greeted by many smiling faces. People were glad I was back, and maybe glad that I was okay John must have mentioned something about my family problems. I spent the morning reflecting on the last two weeks and was pleased to find only a couple of small fires that I needed to put out. My staff really rose to the occasion, and I sincerely praised them for how well they did their job. The only difficulty that day was not worrying about Angie, not wondering what she was really doing at work and whether Tommy would call. It was hard to believe she would do this, but when your trust is gone, it's awfully easy to imagine the worst. That afternoon I received a call, as I expected, from a security genius named Caleb, whom I had contacted from Florida. I knew about him because he once worked for our company. I put Caleb on Tommy's trail asking for any information about his life, particularly about his fiance and his own activities, and he found all the information I needed. It turned out that Emily, his fiance, was also a teacher. She taught history at a local high school. What's even more interesting is that she was a distant relative of the Heinz family and was worth a lot of money. It also turned out that Angie wasn't Tommy's only friend lately. He slept with Darlene, the secretary in Tommy's headmaster's office, a couple of times a week. Caleb, the wizard, had a wonderful set of photographs. He somehow gained access to an apartment in the building directly across the alley from Tommy's house. That evening I explained to Angie what I intended to do with Tommy. My plan started with Angie writing a letter to Emily telling her that Angie and Tommy slept together while he was engaged to Emily. Angie didn't want to write a letter, but I was firm with her. First of all, I said, he would never be sent. I only intended to use it as leverage against Tommy. Secondly, I asked her directly what she was more interested in protecting Tommy or reconciling with me. This question brought about many tears, but Angie wrote the letter I dictated to her without further objection. Later that evening, I set up a new Hotmail account and sent Tommy an email. Using a fictitious name, I introduced myself as the superintendent of a nearby school district. I had heard about what a good teacher Tommy was and was interested in possibly hiring him at one of my schools for a significant raise, of course. Since poaching a teacher in the middle of the year was a bit uncool, I suggested we meet privately one afternoon this week to discuss the possibilities. We met on Thursday afternoon at a local cafe. Tommy was a big guy with an open face, reddish hair, and bright blue eyes. He wasn't particularly handsome, but I could see that women might find him attractive. After we shook hands, he immediately started asking about work. I raised my hand to stop him, said, Why don't you read this first? And handed him a photocopy of Angie's letter. After a few seconds he looked at me, embarrassed and angry. What the hell is this? He hissed trying to speak more quietly. Without losing my cool, I said, just read the rest, Tommy, and then we'll discuss everything. And you should know that there are several more copies of this letter, all of them in the hands of my friends, all of them ready to be mailed if anything happens to me or Angie. When Tommy finished reading the letter, his face flushed with rage. Finally, he put it down and stared at me. Okay, asshole, what does this all mean? I smiled. First of all, let me introduce myself. I'm Alex Ravena, Angie's husband. Secondly, you had an affair with my wife, and I'm not happy about it. Thirdly, you are engaged to a very rich young lady, and if she sees this letter, you will be completely screwed. How am I doing, Tommy? There was silence as he stared at me, no doubt considering his options. He didn't have many. Emily will never believe this letter anyway I could convince her that it's all bullshit. About, I answered. 
What about the part where Angie describes your bedroom beautifully, right down to the cute photo of you and Emily on the dresser? What about the part when she talks about those cute little birthmarks you have? How are you going to explain it all, lover boy? Okay, okay, he hissed. What do you want? It's very simple, I answered. I promise that Emily will never see this letter. In exchange, you give me the key to your apartment and the right to use it for the next three weeks. What the hell are you talking about? You slept with my wife in your apartment, Tommy. Now I'm going to do it with her in your apartment. Then we'll finish. After this, you will not see or hear from me again. I will return the key to you, and all copies of this letter will go straight to the trash bin. He sat and looked at me, no doubt wondering why he got off so easily. And that's all? Three weeks, and then I'm done with you? I nodded. How do I know that you won't send the letter anyway? Good question, Tommy, I said. You'll have to trust me. But you don't have much choice, do you? I give you my word, as soon as these three weeks are over, you will get your key back, and Angie and I will disappear from your life. There was silence again. Then he reluctantly said, Okay, but when will you use my apartment? Only on weekdays, that's when you were there with Angie, right? Therefore, you will need to stay at work from 2.30 to 6 p.m. every weekday for the next three weeks. Nights and weekends are all yours. Do what you want. After a few more questions and answers, we stood up together. There was a hardware store three stores away, and Tommy told them to copy the keys to his apartment. He handed them to me sullenly. Smiling, I handed him a copy of Angie's letter. You can get rid of this, I have more. Today is the third. If you don't play stupid games with me, Tommy, I'll send these keys back to you on the 24th. I waited to see if he would say anything else, but he didn't. Shrugging, he turned and left. I found myself whistling as I entered the house. I must be feeling better. Walking into the kitchen, I saw Angie at the stove and Connie at the table. Both women turned to me with a guilty look. I said hi and walked over to kiss Angie. Before I could even talk to Connie, she said, Look, I have to go. I hope to see you both soon. She seemed terribly strange to me, Angie, I said after a minute. What's happening? Connie arrived about an hour ago, and we chatted a little. As you can imagine, she asked a lot of questions, but I fought off most of them. I told her that we were working on our relationship and that we had a good time in Florida. But I also told her that I felt incredibly guilty about what I did to Tommy and that in the future I would have to keep the details of our marriage a secret, even though she was a close friend. She didn't protest. I think she understands how all that nonsense about Henry contributed to what I did and the trouble we're in now. And that was the same guilty expression. I think so, Angie answered. Without wasting any time, I told her about my conversation with Tommy. There was a charming mixture of impatience and confusion on her face. I told her I wanted to start right away and asked her to meet me at his apartment tomorrow at 3 p.m. Okay, Alex? But can I just say, am I feeling a little nervous about this? I want to do what you want, but it makes me feel even more guilty, you know? For example, it's like returning to the scene of a crime. I hugged her and stroked her hair. I think I can understand that. But let's both keep in mind what the goal is. To enjoy each other, have a good time, create new memories on top of some unpleasant ones. When I think about you and Tommy, I want to be able to replace those thoughts with memories of you and me together. She pulled back far enough to look into my eyes. I don't deserve you, you know that. Instead of punishing me, raking me over the coals, throwing me out into the street, you are so loving and patient with me. I answered her very seriously. Well, maybe you don't deserve me now. God knows you hurt me, but I love you, and when I think about our relationship all these years, you make me happier than anyone I've ever been with. I hope that in a few weeks or a few months, we will both feel that you deserve me. She looked deep into my eyes and, without saying a word, kissed me with a long, passionate kiss. Three weeks of rewriting Angie's novel were strange but fun. I knew I would have to deal with the feelings of anger, and I did. But doing it in Tommy's apartment was exciting. It felt like we were having an affair. And Angie, as I expected, 
was desperate to do this well for me, to completely follow my idea. The final chapter of our romance, a few days later, was at home in our bed, repeating the day I came home twenty minutes early. That evening, after a shower and dinner, I was sitting in my office paying bills when Angie walked in. Wrapped in a robe, with clean hair and no makeup, she looked relaxed and beautiful. She pulled a chair closer to me, sat down, and took my hand. You can probably guess what I want to ask you, Alex. Where are we now? We rewrote my novel, and thank God, it wasn't what I was afraid of. It was exciting and loving and intense, and it forced some wonderful memories to crowd out others. It still kills me what I did. What did I do to you? And I love you more than I can express in words because you didn't just divorce me. For finding a way to be together. For making me feel like I'm worth it. But I'm still a little scared, and I don't know what's on your mind. I gently pulled her into my lap, and she snuggled close to me, resting her head on my shoulder. I only think about the fact that I love you, and that if you cheat on me again, I will kill you. I said this without heat, and then kissed her hair. I can't say that I'm done with what you did, of course, not completely. But I made the decision that we should try to stay together, that you are worth it, as you said, and it still seems like the right decision. I think you should still be afraid, but only a little. And you should know that I still find it very difficult to trust you, and it will probably be that way for a long time. But I know you love me, Angie. I know that you want to be with me, and you are trying your best to show me this. And I know that you make me happy. She didn't say anything else, and we sat in silence for a long time, hugging each other. About a week later, I had the conversation I had been waiting for with Connie. Angie called and invited her to coffee, but when she arrived, Angie was no longer there, and I was waiting for her. Come in, Connie, I asked Angie to call you. I'd like to talk for a few minutes. She looked surprised and a little worried when I poured us two cups. I sat and looked at her. How is your friend Henry? She gasped and put the cup down so hard that the coffee splashed onto the table. Her face was pale, and she asked, Who is Henry? in a trembling voice. I just laughed. Not too convincing, Connie. Henry was the name of the guy you slept with regularly for a few months last year, remember him, which Brad never found out about. The one I had so much fun with was just a fling and Brad would never get hurt. Now do you remember? And before you ask, no Angie didn't tell me anything about this. I found another way, not that it matters. She looked at me, biting her lip. She was clearly very scared. Okay, Alex, I'm listening. What do you want to say? I smiled good-naturedly and said, In short, Connie, you are mine. She gasped again, and I continued. I'm sure you remember all the lofty views you shared with Angie and me a few weeks ago on the subject of adultery. Let me have a look. I think you said that my betrayal humiliates my wife, that I will always feel some contempt for her, knowing that I deceived her. So how's it going with you and Brad? You feel like you're cheating and humiliating him. Is it nice to have a nasty, dirty little secret? She didn't look at me. That's what you told me, Connie, about my fake affair with Christina Blodgett. You said it's wrong, it's disgusting. Even if I hadn't told Angie, it would have been a terrible violation. Her trust. So, Connie, now we have to figure out how to deal with your terrible, despicable breach of trust, don't we? Her hands were shaking. Are you going to tell Brad, Alex? He will divorce me. You know how it will be. Do you want this? I waited in silence for a long time, allowing her to study my impassive face. Finally, I said, No, Connie. I like Brad, and I don't want to see him suffer the way I have suffered these past few weeks. He loves you and apparently trusts you. I don't see anything good in ruining his feelings and his happiness but I feel like some kind of reckoning is inevitable, don't you? Since we agree that what you did was despicable, a violation of trust, don't you owe Brad something? She started to look a little less scared. If you are, if you don't tell Brad, Alex, I'll do whatever you ask. What I mean is very simple, Connie. You're going to make it up to him. You're about to start a campaign to make Brad Williamson the most loved, most pampered, most valuable and most satisfied man in the Midwest. 
Of course, you will have to act very carefully. If you act too harshly, he will probably wonder if you have something that makes you feel guilty. It would defeat the whole purpose. But you will cook his favorite dinners more often. Tell him more often that you love him. Go play golf or watch football with him more often. And most importantly, fulfill all his wishes more often. She began to smile slightly. Obviously, what I had in mind was much less onerous than what she was afraid of. And if he suspects something, Connie, you can give him a simple answer. Honey, I saw what Alex and Angie were going through, how close she was to losing him, and it just scared me. I love you so much, and I want you to never forget this. He'll buy your every word, Connie, trust me. Especially if you keep him tired and happy in bed. Just one more thing. I'm not going to take any of this for granted. Brad and I will communicate regularly. I'm sure he won't be able to resist asking how Angie and I are doing, and I'll respond by casually asking how things are going between him and you. I don't want to hear that everything is fine or about the same as always. I expect to see big smiles and hear happy stories. Is that clear? Connie looked at me silently for a minute. She was relaxed now, no longer embarrassed or scared, but she had a strange expression on her face. Alex, I've known you and Angie for many years, but I've never seen this side of you before. I wouldn't have guessed that you were like this. And yes, I understand. I'm going to do exactly what you said. Trust me, Brad will give you glowing accounts of our marriage in no time. Okay, I said. I stood up and helped Connie up. Kissing her on the cheek, I led her to the door. Glad we could talk, Connie, I said with a smile. See you soon. I mailed Tommy's keys back as soon as Angie and I were done with his apartment. I took no further action for several months. Then I called Caleb and asked him to take care of something. Caleb, you still have photos of Tommy and that girl in his apartment, right? Would you do me one more favor? Please make copies of the photographs and send them. I told him Emily's name and address. They don't need a return address or a cover note or anything like that. They explain everything themselves. But please do one more thing. Look through the photos and find the one that clearly shows the framed photo on the dresser that's Tommy and his fiance. Then just take a grease pencil and circle it so she doesn't miss it. I want her to know that these photos were taken recently since she and Tommy got engaged. I smiled to myself and hung up. I smiled at Angie. I talked to Brad this morning. And what? Looks like he and Connie are on something of a second honeymoon. He was eager to tell me about their weekend. Looks like she put on quite a show for him. He, of course, asked how we were doing, but barely waited for my answer before launching into the story. I guess we can conclude that Connie is keeping her end of the bargain. Angie smiled back at me. How are we doing, Alex? I think we're doing pretty damn good, Angie. Damn good. Subscribe to our channel so that your second chaff doesn't cheat on you and go ahead and listen to the next story, because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think about listening to the next one.